the arrival of low Earth orbit or LEO satellite constellations in the world of maritime communications has caused much excitement. But where does this leave incumbent geo satellite communications providers? Hi, this is Marcus Hand, editor of Sea Trade Maritime News, and in this latest episode of the Sea Trade Maritime podcast, we talk to Ben Palmer, president of Imarsat Maritime, about how it sees the future of maritime communications. Thank you, Ben. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Just before we get into talking about what Imarsat is doing at the moment, maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background coming into satellite communications. Hi, Marcus. Great to be with you today. Thanks for having me. I joined Imarsat just over two years ago, and I lead the, the maritime piece of what is now Viasat, because we merged with Viasat, uh, one of our peers in the industry, you know, during the course of last year. My background is is not in the, the telco space or indeed really in the space world. I've got a background in defense and national security. I've spent about 25 years knocking around initially in government and then in industry in in sort of high tech complex businesses and uh, really have a focus on driving operational and financial performance. I've, I've done turnaround, I've done growth uh, and it's been fascinating to to dip into and learn about uh, the new world that is, for me, that is uh, space and maritime communications. That's very interesting. So that, that coming from that different background, and you mentioned there the merger with Viasat. So how has that changed things at Imarsat? Obviously, you came on board as that was all happening. Yeah, well, my time at Imarsat has been really dominated by the, the merger. I actually joined on the day that the deal was was announced. And I suppose the first thing to say, Marcus, is it's been a long time coming. And it took us 18 months to close the deal and go through all the regulatory discussions that that we needed to have on a a complex deal like this. And so I suppose the first reaction when we got finally got to the finish line last May was sigh of relief and 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 some excitement that we had completed the deal. I mean, hey, look, bringing two big companies, one very focused in the United States, one with a real global footprint, one very strong in government and aviation, and the other. With a, with a really balanced footprint across maritime aviation government. It's been really exciting. We're bringing together two companies with complementary capabilities, obviously a much bigger business, much deeper and broader global reach. And I've been really impressed with the technology focus that our Biosat colleagues have, are bringing, bringing to bear. We're merging and bringing together our two constellations. That takes time. And we're also excited about the seven additional geo uh, satellites that will be launching over the course of the next couple of years, which will really bring massive additional capacity and capability to bear in, in serving our customers. So it's a process that's, uh, that's, that it obviously has its challenges in integrating uh, 7,000 people, bringing together people in, in the States and across the globe is always, it always has its moments, but um, yeah, we're, we're nine months in and uh, and we're really excited about what the future has to hold. Excellent. And uh, it's quite interesting that you're talking about merging the constellations. What's involved in that sort of process? It's not a short-term activity. We've got essentially two separate uh, constellations of satellites, the Imarsat uh, in, in KA band and in L band and and Viasat in KA band. They're different networks, different ground infrastructures different service delivery models and different, frankly, ultimately different different terminals. So we're, we're building a roadmap that will help us to enable folks to roam across uh, the networks in, in due course. That involves quite a lot of fairly focused technical work around terminal interoperability, both looking forwards and looking backwards. For me in the maritime domain, our, my, my biggest focus is how to make the best use of the new Viasat 3 satellites that we're in the process of launching because they're, they're going to bring, frankly, fantastic um, transmission capacity and speeds to bear in a way that the maritime industry hitherto hasn't seen from uh, the kind of secure global mobile services that, that imarsat has been, been specialised in. So from my perspective, getting the right, um, the right roadmap, building the right alignment between our terminal development and our satellite launch development and launch timeframes and programs is, is really important. And then inevitably, there's an awful lot of work to do, frankly, from a proposition development perspective, 
to to make sure it, we're aligned. But um, yeah, it's 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 a lot of work. It's complex work, but it's exciting work, and it's uh, I think something that will bring real value to our customers uh, as we look into the next few years. Great. Those new satellites that you're talking about there. How does this fit? Because we've got, you know, there's a lot, been a lot of excitement in the industry around low Earth orbit, you know, Leo constellations. How does what you're doing sort of fit with that? And you know, going forward, one of the things I'd, I'd say at the outset is that I was struck when I came into the industry by a slightly binary sense that people wanted to talk about, you know, Leo or Geo as if they were somehow mutually exclusive or there wasn't there wasn't going to be room for, for both and i think the, the reality and this is sort of playing out over time marcus is firstly demand for capacity is growing massively across the maritime segment as it is actually across the wider economy we're seeing demand for crew and and actually business applications has risen by you know 70 and 50 percent respectively over the last couple of years and so I think the first thing to say is that uh, this is an industry that's growing. It's an industry in which demand is is increasing. And it's an industry in which, from frankly, I, I suggest quite a low base, we're seeing a greater embrace by ship owners, operators and managers, and frankly, their customers and stakeholders of new use cases around digitalization, which will drive greater adoption, greater need for uh, capacity and, and bandwidth and connectivity in order to drive efficiency, effectiveness in business operations, and also, frankly, to enable the decarbonisation agenda that the industry has set itself upon. And I think in that context, it's fair to say that a network of network type approach, a seamless service by which chip owners, operators and managers, end customers benefit from being able to access the best connectivity for the application that they have in mind at the time through a single service is actually probably the way in which the industry is going to evolve. And in that context, you know, Geo and Leo and LTE and 5G, and, and we might talk a little bit about the, the work we've been doing in the 5G space in, in a moment, but, but I think a combination of different underlays is going to be you know, the way in which the industry evolves. And customers are going to need you know, security, they're going to need resilience, they're going to need reliability and certainty, not only that they have the right capacity or the right speed or the right latency for the use case that they're focused on, but they also have a certainty and trust in the service that's being provided overall. And so, you know, it's really exciting to see uh, very successful, innovative companies coming into this space you know, frankly, I, I, I think it's great to be in a market that's attracting that kind of investment. It's really exciting to see the innovation that's being driven uh, on the back of that. It's uh, important that Imarsat and Biosat respond and make sure that we are addressing uh, customer need. And I believe our Biosat 3 satellites, when they arrive, will enable us, by dint of being able to focus capacity where it is most needed and in some parts of the globe you'll appreciate are busier than others particularly in a maritime context i think we've got a really powerful value proposition to bring to bear but i think it's important that we kind of get out of the one or the other view of different means of, of connecting people across the globe and, and start thinking about the complementarity of an orchestrated network and that's really where you know our thinking has been for a while and you know, you know where in the next uh, in the coming months we will be looking to drive progress from a value proposition perspective. Okay, I'm probably going to come back to you in a minute and just sort of ask you how that sort of orchestration network would work. But I'm going to ask you about a couple of developments you've had over the last year. You had the service Fleet Reach launched, I think it was June last year, and that's sort of focusing on coastal communications, isn't it? And I'm just you know, if you could explain the reasons behind that and what you're trying to do there. I think this for us has been a little bit, if we're honest, of, of catching up. And I mean, we, we the Fleet Express managed service that we is really the centerpiece of our secure, mobile, reliable, resilient connectivity service has served the industry really well. We've got 
uh, nearly 15,000 ships are operating on FX today. It's grown pretty successfully over the last few years. But it's also important to innovate and to bring new capabilities and, uh, and, and technologies to bear to bolster that managed service. And so bringing a, an LTE, um, Fleet, uh, Fleet Reach uh, fits, that, fits that sort of uh, descriptor, bringing an LTE service uh, to complement that as part of a managed service that enables vessels close to shore, where oftentimes they A, are able to access terrestrial networks and B, have a demand, particularly for business and operational uh, traffic that can peak. And so when we wanted to be able to offer our customers the opportunity to really access and benefit from, from that technology in addition to the KA band and the L band that, that makes this, this sort of underpins the, the Fleet Express proposition. You know, I, I don't pretend that that's desperately revolutionary, Marcus, but it was an important incremental addition to our service. And it's one that um, the customers have responded well to. Now, you've been in Saudi recently as well, and um, you're partnering with Aramco for the 5G overwater service, uh, like a, a trial of that, I think. Could you tell our listeners a bit more about that? Yeah, it's been really exciting. I, I uh, It was great to go back to Saudi. There was a time in my career where I used to visit the kingdom quite a lot, and I, I hadn't been for a while, and it was fascinating, actually, to see the, the changes and the progress that have been made in, in, in recent years. But, um, but, but I, I digress. The work we're doing with Aramco is really exciting too, and that's really about developing uh, and testing and trialing uh, a, an innovative 5G mesh networking technology that we've been exploring for a couple of years now. And, you know, we're at the, what I would describe as the early stages of the development and, uh, and trialing of, of this technology. And what we wanted to do, Marcus, was take it somewhere where it would be really stressed. And there are not many places in the world that are as stressful as the Arabian Gulf in the middle of summer. And so what we've agreed with the Ramco is a, 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 to get to work together to trial and test uh, this capability in the course of the next few months in, in the Persian Gulf. What we're excited about is the possibility to create a multinodal mesh network using some ground base stations on the shore, but also using receivers on uh, rigs uh, and on vessels transiting through densely populated, high demand areas of sea and being able to create a very secure, very high capacity, very high speed, very low latency data network that will be, I think, really exciting in the context of the very high demand, high capacity needs, data and digitalization needs of somebody running you know, complex operations such as, as Aramco. And I think the use case here is really exciting. There are other potential uh, and extensible use cases that one could imagine. And that's exciting too, as we, as we sort of look to explore this capability and its utility downstream. But the first step is to see if it works. We've, we've done some trials and tests in what I would describe as rather more benign environments and frankly, the results have been really encouraging. And so what we're looking forward to now is to taking this out and really giving it a hard time and seeing whether with our, with our partners at Aramco, uh, whether this merits further development together and further exploration together, because I think we both think that there's something really exciting that we may possibly have, uh, have come across. So it, it's going to be an interesting uh, few months. It's really exciting to have a partner as credible, as demanding, um, and as material as as one of the world's leading uh, oil and gas companies. And so we're really excited about what the what the next few months hold. You did mention the other use cases there. So could you possibly share what those might be? If we find that um, that it works as we expect that it will then I think it's certainly possible to think about how you might deploy similar uh, infrastructure to develop a similar type of mesh network in other heavily, uh, populated is the wrong word when we're talking about the sea, but heavily uh, high, high density areas 
with high demand for uh, bandwidth and capacity. And you could think about that in the context of other parts of the world where there are significant concentrations of uh, hydrocarbon extraction offshore. We've uh, you know, postulated and thought about how it might be extensible to other high density areas where you have lots of ships, lots of vessels, uh, congregating or being being uh, transiting through with regularity, a you know an area of high density, and, and you can think about maritime choke points around the world. And I also think there are potential overland opportunities too to create this high capacity, high density, secure network for other 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 use cases. So I think there's a range of, of those, and and I you know if I if I think back to my old world, Marcus, of the world of defence, I, I think it's possible to hypothesise about a range of potentially um, useful use cases there, but I'll let other people worry about that. My focus right now is on the trial with the Ramco and how we can together uh, make this technology successful and how we can work together to mutual benefit to, to take that forward. Well, that sort of brings me back to you. We're talking about this sort of kind of orchestrated set of services with different platforms. I was wondering how you bring all these together and make them kind of work, I guess, seamlessly with each other. Well, I think that's the smart bit. And at one level, at heart, you know, Inmarsat has been in the managed service game for a long time. FX, one of the great things about the Fleet Express proposition is the combination of L band and KA band, the capacity, if you like, of of the KA with the you know, really deep resilience and reliability of the L band has been a really powerful combination. And we've, as I've already mentioned, we've added the LTE layer to that. And at heart, that's about the management and the optimization of a service. And as we bring new underlays in, and the, obvi- the obvious new underlay will be Viasat 3 over the course of the next couple of years as that constellation is spun up. And we're also talking and have been discussing how we might access other third party networks too to bolster uh, the capacity uh, and the service that we can offer our customers in the in the short to medium term. You know, software defined networking capabilities to manage, optimize and offer our customers a really tailorable service that meets their different use cases. Whether that's around true welfare, crew access, crew entertainment which of course has been a major focus for Leo uh, uptake in recent years. And for me, the equally important and critical business operational, and what I would call the mission critical piece of shipping operations, you know, that's going to rely upon highly sophisticated, software-defined management, traffic shaping, traffic management, bandwidth optimization technologies, and, and that's... Uh, you know, at the heart of what we're hoping to bring to market, what we're planning to bring to market over the course of the coming months. So, yes, it's, you know, one of the things I I have exposure to, I've I've done a little bit of space in the past in my career, and I've done a a little bit of maritime, and I've done a little bit of comms. The thing I think the glue that is going to pull those things together and really help us to drive value for customers going forwards, and certainly a, a piece of glue from my past experience has been that that systems and software engineering capability that really lies at the heart of uh, Inmarsat, Viasat's competence and capability. And that, that's going to think, I think, be a really important part of our ability to differentiate ourselves and drive value to our customers over time. Being able to put capacity using steerable beams on satellites where it's really necessary and where people really need it is going to be, I think, a differentiator. And being able to manage the service and provide the kind of surety and certainty that customers have come to trust us for is going to be important. And underpinning a lot of that is going to be that heavy software and systems engineering capability that, that I think, frankly, uh, is, is you know, really a strength of, of the combined business going forwards. When you say software and engineering capability, you mean in terms of managing those services or actually providing software that uh, ship owners and ship managers will use? I think that's a really interesting question. Certainly the former in terms of the delivery of our service. I think the ability to provide people with a tailorable service that, that, 
that meets their different use case needs, that manages their consumption, or it helps them to manage their consumption and optimize the service that they provide across. You know, I, I think of ships as being a combination of an office, a factory, and a hotel, <laughs> and and different different users, different uh, different use cases have different profiles in terms of their capacity, density, needs, both from a geographic and temporal perspective. And I think using data to really understand that, uh, using data to model and predict that, and then shaping our service using a highly sophisticated software to optimize that to meet the different use cases and different and different need statements of those different sort of aspects of, of ship operations, I think is going to be really important to us. The tantalizing thought behind your second question is also really interesting. And you know, being able to add or to bring value added services to bear to enhance ship owners, operators and managers ability to do their business, I think is an interesting theme, Marcus. We already have a portfolio of those, what we call value adding, value adding services. And I think it will be interesting to see over the coming, the coming years, uh, the extent to which both industry demand, technology, and where value is captured, and where that takes us in terms of evolving our proposition. But I guess my, my focus right now is, you know, connectivity is, is going to be the oxygen that breathes life into the digitalization of the industry and as a you know leading player in the provision of that connectivity i think it's up to us it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we've uh, optimized our proposition from that perspective such that people can exploit the benefits that everybody sees both are possible to exploit and necessary to exploit so i i I, I think that the first piece is absolutely essential and it lies at the heart of our connectivity proposition. I, I expect over time that we will see greater propensity for people to think about how they can exploit value and it would be remiss of us not to be thinking about where that takes us as a business over time. What I would like, probably like to ask you on the back of that is, so where do you see the maritime communications industry headed over the next two to three years? And how does Imarsat fit into all of that? I always like to answer those questions by starting with, you know, where are our customers taking us? It's easy to say, well, this is where the technology will allow us to go. But I think we have to start with where's the customer going? And I think Certainly, we're seeing a real uptake in, uptake in focus on, on providing crew with the kind of internet experience that people have come to expect in, on dry land. I think that's uh, an inevitability, not least given the need to attract and retain sufficient people to, to make the world go round. And let's not forget that the shipping industry delivers 90% of global trade across 71% of the Earth's surface. So I think that's going to be a sustained focus. I think people are still going to want, however, to be able to look with certainty to their communications and connectivity providers and to rely upon a resilient, secure, global mobile service with the right levels of customer support and the right resilience built in such that when it really matters from a mission critical operational perspective they can do their business efficiently and effectively and so i think that's a that's 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 a likely uh, constant in our industry and i think that's going to get more important and the reason i think that is because i think this industry is in the foothills really of thinking about how to exploit value from data both in order to drive competitive advantage at the operator level by being more efficient, by consuming less fuel, by being more able to prevent and predict the need for repairs or maintenance, by optimizing routes, by exploiting the sort of base level capabilities that technology and data can bring to bear. I think the industry is also in the foothills, frankly, of creating new value streams around cargo, cargo monitoring, cargo optimization, and potentially even the ability to do things to cargo en route so that it arrives 
in the optimum state. And I think that's a that's a that's actually a less of a bottom line optimization opportunity, but actually a top line value creation opportunity for customers. I think you're going to see a lot of potential interest in that in that area over time from shippers end to end across the value chain. I think that you're going to see an increased focus on automation and autonomization. That's something I know quite a lot about from my past world of defense. What is technologically possible has historically been in advance of what is what people get or being able to do. But I think we are going to see greater use of autonomous and automation type capabilities on board ships. And that's going to place a premium on the kind of reliable, resilient communications and connectivity services as, as much on the uplink as, mu- as well as on the downlink. I think that's going to be an important thing. And then I also think this decarb agenda is really important, Marcus, because not only will connectivity, reliable connectivity be absolutely essential to our ability to get comfortable with carrying new fuels around the globe on, on large ships, because we need to be able to assure ourselves that whether it's ammonia or hydrogen or some other new fuel elixir, that it's safe. But that's, if you like, that's a future facing opportunity. I think the immediate opportunity is really around the law of small incremental gains, which says that connectivity data will allow us to make quite big strides quite quickly if we get our act together around reducing fuel consumption, being more efficient with our fuel and driving carbon out of our existing value chains. And so I think those are all going to be really important trends for the industry. And I think the consistent element of that is that, you know, secure, reliable, mobile, resilient communications on which people can rely with certainty and on which they can rely with certainty when they need it, in the places they need it, at the capacity and volume and speed that they need it, is going to place a premium on the kind of managed, multi-layer, seamless connectivity proposition that I was talking about earlier on in our discussion. A lot of different factors driving demand there, then. Yeah, I, I think one thing's for sure. I mean, I think, I think we're in a really interesting time. There's a really interesting set of innovative new entrants coming into our industry as a you've talked about the, the kind of leo mania i'll put it that way um, and that's really exciting and there's a whole bunch of ambiguities and and uncertainties and complexities about how the, the industry will evolve i think one thing that is certain is that the factors that i've just described will continue to drive demand for secure mobile resilient connectivity across the globe and will continue to drive demand from ship owners, operators and managers for a service on which, upon which they can rely with certainty. And I think those are the things that you know, we've got a lot of work to do. I talked about integration earlier. I talked about uh, bringing our networks together. I talked about the terminal development activities that we need to do. I've talked about the way in which our proposition may evolve and the value adds that we may need to bring in. But those are all, you know, important ways to an end in an environment where demand is, you know, I, I think certain to, to, to continue to grow. And that's whilst a lot of those things keep me awake at night, Marcus, because there's a lot of complexity in there. Uh, ultimately, that's the thing that helps me to get to sleep at night. That's a very interesting equation, that one. Um, I think that's a really nice place to round it off as well. Um, ben, thank you so much for taking the time today. No, hey, great, great to connect with you again. And uh, I know you're in Singapore and I'm looking forward to, to getting back out to what is, I know, one of the great hubs of the maritime world, uh, actually twice during April. So um, I'm going to be busy uh, getting on planes again and looking forward to getting out and seeing seeing people. Maybe we maybe we'll catch up then. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and thanks for taking the time to talk to our listeners. And we'll see you on the next episode of the Sea Trade Maritime Podcast. Mm-hmm.